and welcome to another edition of the Action Network's Fantasy Flex Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Raybon, here with Sean Kerner and a very, very special guest. Really excited to have him on. It is Evan Silva, the co-founder of Establish the Run. We are going to talk quarterbacks today. Evan, how you doing, man? Thanks for joining us. Hey, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. The season is, is upon us. I've been listening to your guys' uh, shows religiously. You guys are crushing it. Um, it's good to be, it's, it's good to talk some ball with you. Absolutely, man. And we're not even going to, we're not even going to delay it. We're just going to get right into it. So Evan, I, I just want to start with you on like, we're going to go through the top 12 quarterbacks by ADP and, and go through each one. But before we do that, I just want to know, like, what's your overall quarterback strategy as, as you kind of enter a fantasy draft? Are you a late round guy? Are there any exceptions? Do you change it up for, you know, league type or anything like that? Absolutely change it up for league type. And, and that's, you know, I, I think it's, it's kind of stale and it's not a sexy thing to say, but knowing the format and the rules and the scoring system better than your opponent in the league in which you're about to draft and, and, and play and run waivers and all that, that really is the biggest advantage that you can carve out in fantasy football. Um, but in general, and I think that my, my approach to the quarterback position has uh, sort of progressed over the years, and especially last year, kind of spurred by what a difference it was to have Kyler Murray or Josh Allen or, you know, one of the big time quarterbacks in your, uh, in your starting position in, in DFS. Um, it made me think that maybe we, we need to start transitioning away from the, you know, the, the, the traditional late round uh, quarterback strategy and into one where we're a little bit more aggressive taking quarterbacks that we think can, they can have those true difference maker years in the middle rounds. Um, I don't know if this is necessarily right. And if it's a long-term thing and it's something that's going to stick, but it's definitely something that um, I, I've considered. And especially if I like, let's say my first round pick is Tyree kill. I'm going to be a lot more likely to reach a little bit for Patrick Mahomes, you know, in the third or, or ideally fourth round, Mark Andrews say, I take him, you know, in a tight end premium league in the third round, which I did. I took him in pros versus Joe's last night, came back, got Lamar Jackson in the fifth round, felt really good about that. Um, so that is, uh, you know, one uh, element of quarterback strategy where I think that I've changed in recent years, a lot caused by, uh, by, you know, playing daily fantasy. And another one is just that these quarterbacks that can run have really changed the game. And I know Raybon and Sean, you guys have really beaten the drum for this and you've been hundred percent correct. The quarterbacks that can run are st for, for a really long time, the late round quarterback strategy was so successful because there just wasn't that big of a difference between quarterback seven and quarterback 15, at, le at least on a weekly basis. I mean, they might be separated by 1.5 points, you know, but now the quarterbacks that can run um, and of course, Patrick Mahomes who can run, but he's not, you know, as, as deadly with his legs as some of the, the other guys, but I mean, he can pass at such an, an elite and efficient clip and he's surrounded by such big time playmakers that he can absolutely score like these guys. And we've seen that consistently. Um, that those guys now have kind of evolved into their own tier and it's almost become a, a, an early round tier and Dak Prescott can absolutely score like that. And Kyler Murray, Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes and Lamar Jackson. So that's been sort of the evolution of, of my thinking at, at, at quarterback. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And, and Sean, what do you think of uh, kind of, I really thought that the point of like, it's not really late round quarterback anymore. It's kind of middle round quarterback now. What are your thoughts on that, Sean? Yeah, yeah. Great points by Evan, um, as always. I think right now, you know, the top six quarterbacks, we can, we're going to go in depth on all six, but they all have QB1 upside, every single one of them. So I'm just more of a passive, like if any one of those six fall to me at a good point in the draft, I'm all for it. Um, but I, I do think, you know, falling back on just beginning the season, streaming quarterback, it is a decent strategy. I mean, I've been able to stream QB six to QB 10 numbers the past few seasons. And, you know, you're not going to be just streaming, uh, you know, Carson Wentz and Kirk Cousins all season. Like last year, I ended up with Justin Herbert in a few leagues that I didn't even draft a quarterback. And in a couple, I ended up with Jalen Hurts towards the end of the season. So it's like, you can stumble on a jackpot like that, even if you're streaming. So um, we, we can go dive into it a little bit later. So I think 
in the QB 10 to 15 range, I'm a little bit cautious reaching for the, those guys when, you know, they're kind of a dime a dozen in season and you just play matchups, but I'm all for, you know, aggressively trying to get at least one of these top six QBs. Yeah. I think, I think the, the, the great point is that both of you guys are making is it's kind of the, the value has kind of transitioned a little more to where you can get a top six guy that may fall. I think, you know, the issue with going full on late round quarterback um, is, or, or the kind of the, both the benefit and the, you know, the thing that could hurt you is that, you know, you could either end up streaming for longer than you want. You may not find that guy. Um, but the benefit is that we don't know exactly which one of these guys will kind of pop off in, in those middle rounds um, necessarily. Um, Evan, I know you had some ideas last year. Cause uh, I remember you were on that. If I'm not mistaken, like the, the Josh Allen MVP train. Yeah. And I mean, he, you know, where, where do you end up going about like, not, like maybe like the ninth, 10th turn, I would say. Yeah. Uh, like a lot of QB seven. Range. Yeah. Q yeah, seven, eight, I mean, nine. Yeah. And and the whole bills offense was, was undervalued beginning with him. Stefan Diggs was like the wide receiver, 27 ADP. I didn't have Steph, Stephon Diggs nearly high enough last year. Cole Beasley had an awesome season. Um, you know, I, I just recently, I, I don't want to jump ahead too much, but I just recently bumped Josh Allen to my number one overall quarterback for this year. Um, and it's based on just immense continuity. They're bringing back everyone. Um, the only guy they lost is John Brown and they replaced him with Manny Sanders, Gabriel Davis. I think the arrow was pointing up on him. Um, so they're, I mean, they're just going to, they're running it back. It's crazy that the NFL let Brian Dable go back to the bills to be their offensive coordinator. This guy, you know, would be a better head coach probably than, than 10 coaches across the league, at least based on what he has done strategically uh, from an offensive standpoint. Absolutely. So let's, let's just actually jump ahead. Cause that that's a really interesting point. And we're going to go kind of by ADP here. Um, the consensus ADP at fantasy pros for quarterbacks. So uh, Patrick Mahomes still is that number one consensus quarterback at ESPN at Yahoo at CVS at, at fan tracks at the FFC. Uh, so uh, pretty much across the board, Mahomes is number one. So we'll get to Allen in a moment, Silva, but I guess kind of more so make the point of, you know, what enabled you to kind of bump Mahomes down? Because I think that's what a lot of people have trouble with. It's not that I think everyone kind of realizes that Allen has the same upside. Um, but what did you kind of see to kind of bump some anybody ahead of, of Patrick Mahomes? Well, I've been juggling these guys in the top tier and I don't have Dak in the top tier right now. And that's purely based on his reco his injury recovery. Uh, but I had the top four as Josh Allen, one, Lamar Jackson, two, Mahomes, three, mm. And then Kyler Murray four, but then if you look at my overall rankings, they're all right next to each other. And, and I mean, I've changed them already a couple of times, and I'll probably change them a couple more times. I, I just think they're really hard to to pick from. Um, and ultimately, what you what you want to do if you're going to draft one of these guys, you let the early rounds dictate whether you will. And again, you know, coming back to uh, a stack stack opportunities, um, especially in the in the um, you know in, in in higher stakes tournaments. Uh, it's really easy to stack right now Mark Andrews, Lamar Jackson, and Marquise Brown, or Rashad Bateman, or maybe even a little Gus Edwards late. You know, it's really easy to, to pull that off. I think it's pretty easy to, to stack um, like DeAndre Hopkins and Kyler Murray. People seem to be not high enough, I think, on De DeAndre Hopkins this year. Uh, to me, he's a first-round pick, and his ADP is more in like the 16 to 20 overall range. Uh, but letting those early rounds dictate – uh, you know, where I'm going to go with my quarterback pick. That's what I'm personally going to do in terms of my, my actual rankings that I have to put into cement. You know, the, I, I'm juggling the, these guys around. Where, where are you guys at with these guys? Sean, I'll, uh, I'll let you jump in on, on Mahomes, who averaged, you know, 316 yards last year, 308 for his career. Is he still your number one overall uh, QB? Yeah, he's still my uh, number one overall QB. And, you know, he's going to be extra motivated after that just humiliating Super Bowl loss. He's even said that he wants to go 20-0 and 0 or 21-0, and 0, however many games it takes now to have a perfect <laughs> season. Um, so I, I don't want to bet against them necessarily. Um, and, you know, now that we have 17 games, I mean, the chances of him having a record-breaking season um, seems pretty high. I mean, this is going to be another season where he has Tyreek Hill and Travis Kelsey – so, you know, I don't want to bet against them. Having said all that, I'm probably not drafting him, number one, because like I said earlier, I, I kind of want the draft, uh, someone else to set the tone in the draft as to when we start to make this run at QB. Um, you know, 
I can't disagree too much with Evan. Like if anybody takes Josh Allen, the first QB, it's hard to argue with that. So I typically let just somebody else draft Patrick Mahomes and then grab whichever QB falls to me after that. Um, having said that though, like I do want to invest in this offense. So I think the better thing to do is invest in Terry Kill or Travis Kelsey or Clyde Edwards Hilaire. Like I do not want to fade this offense at all, but when it comes to the QB position specifically, I think it's better just to let somebody else take him early, but we, we definitely want to invest in this offense. Yeah. One thing, I, that, one thing that you'll notice, I think, uh, with, with regard to Patrick Mahomes, as it relates to the other quarterbacks in, in this theoretical first tier, is that his ADP is like measurably higher than the other guys. I mean, he's, if you look at football guys championship ADP, uh, Patrick Mahomes is about a round, he's going about a round earlier than any of these guys start to get drafted. Um, so I, I think there, there's definitely a lot of, a lot of confidence and, and, you know, justifiably so, but a lot of confidence from the community in Patrick Mahomes that, that he has an edge on the other three guys. I'm not so sure of that, but I mean, I mean, yeah, I, I don't say negative things about Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> yeah. I don't think there's anything negative to say about Mahomes. I think it's to your point, Evan, he's going around earlier than Josh Allen and just all these quarterbacks in general, like the first couple, there's like a round, uh, you know, that round six picks, nine, 10 picks between these guys. And so there's a lot of margin for error where if you're just waiting, you know, to, to your point, more so to like that, the middle rounds to be aggressive, even if it's not like a true rate, late round quarterback strategy, you're just waiting until, you know, that QB five, six, seven, whoever falls as Sean, you mentioned, you know, that's where you're really getting the value because that's what we're trying to get. Because, like, if you're wrong on Mahomes, and by wrong, I don't mean that, like, he's suddenly going to be, like, even an average or above average passer. He's still going to be elite almost no matter what. But if you're wrong because, let's say, he misses four games or something like that or, and then takes another one off in week eight, you know, in week 18 or, or you know, that that can really hurt you. Um, well, maybe not the week 18 because that, that would be not a fantasy. League, but you know what I mean? Like, if he misses games, that could really hurt you because – you know, you could have waited another 12 picks and got a Josh Allen. You could have waited another, you know, 36 picks and or 48 and still got like a Russell Wilson or somebody like that. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's where I think I am with Mahomes. I still have him ranked number one. Um, Evan, I'm not, I'm not going to put him under other guys, but I certainly understand your strategy and, and to why you would kind of target um, somebody like Allen or, or, or Jackson more because you can stack with them. So let, let's talk about Allen, Evan, because I really want to get your take. Or, or just what you see in Allen to have him rank um, as the QB one, just kind of walk us through um, why he's the safest, highest upside pick for you right now. Yeah, it's the, it's absolutely the, um, the, the continuity, which is something that I, I think is absolutely worth betting on the way that the bills play. They were what, number one in, um, in, in, in past percentage uh, when you uh, in neutral situations last year in both the first half and across the full game, you know, they, they passed to win. Um, they, they use their running game as a change of pace. They use a ton of play action, which has proved to be almost like a cheat code uh, in the NFL. They've got, I mean, they are willing to play a true spread offense and, um, they, and they've got the, the depth that receiver to do it. And if you look at Josh Allen, who came into the league, you know, very polarizing prospect, I would say not even a particularly high percentage prospect coming out of Wyoming. I mean, you go back to Wyoming, they built that offense around Brian Hill, you know, Brian Hill, who's bounced around to the Falcons. I think he's with Carolina now. And, you know, he's, and they, they, they didn't really even utilize Josh Allen as the focal point of that offense in college. He arrives in the NFL as a tremendously raw player. He, um, you know, he, he absolutely had major accuracy concerns but every year he's taken a, a remarkable step forward. And I mean, at some point he's going to reach his ceiling, but man, I, I'm not sure that he's reached his ceiling yet. And he is a dominant runner. I mean, th there's no question in my mind that Sean McDermott and uh, Brandon Bean, you know, the Bills uh, decision makers who were both in Carolina with Cam Newton saw Cam Newton in Josh Allen and we, I mean, at, at this point, I think the trajectory is that Josh Allen could even have a better career than, than Cam Newton. So uh, just uh, so many things working in Josh Allen's favor from the dual threat dominance to, you know, the supporting cast to the environment. I think it's a great organization to bet on. Um, that, that's why I, I, I love Josh Allen as the highest floor and highest upside quarterback on the board this year. 
Sean, uh, I know you kind of, you and Evan were kind of going at it last year on this same very podcast um, about Josh Allen um, after 4,444 yards and 37 passing touchdowns. I'm guessing you've come around. Uh, the question is just like how much, like how close, how, how, how much can you see him replicating uh, what he did last year, Sean? Yeah, so kudos to Evan on that call last year. Um, I am making up for it by not projecting any regression in his rushing stats. Um, I'm not worried about Zach Moss. Like, that's all gone. So I'm not penciling him in for seven, eight rushing touchdowns. I'm sharpening him in. <laughs> seven, I'm just not even messing with that. So, you know, I, I agree with Evan where, um, you know, th there is some concern. He could regress this year. You know, last year he had the fourth best completion percentage, but his catchable ball percentage was 22nd. And a lot of that you can you give credit to the high quality wide receivers that he has. Um, so that's where the continuity comes into play. He still has Stephon Diggs. He still has Cole Beasley. Um, Gabe Davis is going to be even better in year two. And, you know, Manny Sanders is equal um, as John Brown. So, you know, he, he retains a lot of that talent he had around him last year. Brian Dable remaining OC is huge. Um, I think it's a credit to their, their playoff run last year. They went so deep that he wasn't able to take a job elsewhere. All the coaching vacancies sort of filled up um, when they were still in the playoffs. So that, that kind of helped out Josh Allen uh, for this year. Uh, but Dable, you know, he cranked up the play action passing. Um, Josh Allen had the most play action dropbacks last year. That was a huge part of his success. Um, you know, back in 2019, he only ranked 21st. So I think we're going to see a ton of that play action a lot of four wide, wide receiver sets. So a lot of the things are in place where I think even if Josh Allen sees some mini regression, he's still a top two quarterback. So I think, you know, he's, he's in the elite tier with Patrick Mahomes. I have them ranked very close together. All right, let's go to the number three quarterback. Now, Kyler Murray, Evan, uh, Kyler Murray was the QB three last year. That's what he finished at in terms of total points. And he did it which is so interesting to me and kind of goes back to your point about the, the running quarterbacks. He did it averaging just 7.1 yards per pass attempt. Uh, and, and his rookie year, he was at 6.9. So, so he's not really been efficient through the air, but of course he makes up with it on the ground. Evan, I, you have Kyler. Um, where do you have Kyler first of all? And then like, how do you see uh, AJ Green, uh, Moore, the rookie, how do you see those guys kind of impacting his pass efficiency? So, I have him, I have Kyler Murray fir firmly in this first tier, but at the bottom of the tier, because I think it's tough in watching him play, you know, uh, I mean, he, he reminds me like a, of Allen Iverson, you know, if, if, there's not a great NFL comp for him, but like a sports comp, he reminds me of Allen Iverson. I mean, he is just nasty with the ball in his hands. I still think 11 rushing touchdowns is going to be tough to repeat, but if you're looking at, just straight rushing production across the league. I think it's Kyler Murray and Lamar Jackson. Those guys are going to go at it to be the, the true number one rushing quarterback in the league from a yardage and, and, and possibly rushing TD standpoint. Um, I, I mean, I think Kyler Murray has maybe a thousand rushing yards in his potential range of outcomes. Um, I think, you know, Josh Allen is more like 800 and, and Lamar, shoot, we've seen him go over a thousand now twice in a row. So I think that Kyler Murray is in that tier with him just from a rushing standpoint. But you mentioned he's he is not fully developed as a passer. Um, I think he's been a, an inconsistent passer. He did improve in every uh, rate stat from his rookie to sophomore year. So he did get a little bit better. He's small, though. And I don't know, you, you could maybe, uh, uh, you know, place some of the blame on some of the scrub receivers that they've been running out there and tight ends. I mean, they had DeAndre Hopkins and then a whole lot of nothing, a little bit of Christian Kirk last year mixing in. But um, and I don't I don't know that. I mean, what did A.J. Green show us to give us any confidence that he's really going to raise the level, help elevate Kyler Murray's passing? I did love the addition of Rodney Hudson to play center. Mm -hmm. And I think that their O-line should be a little bit better. Um, but he's at the bottom of the tier because, yeah, we have not seen him. Uh, throw the football at, at the rate of like a, a Josh Allen or a Patrick Mahomes yet. Uh, but I, I do think that he's got a thousand rushing yards in, in, in his range of potential outcome. And that's why he's in this tier. Sean, what do you think of Kyler? It was year three uh, for Josh Allen when he really took that, that kind of weep throwing the football. Um, is that something you see, see potentially um, for Kyler heading into to year three, Sean? 
Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, Rayvon, I can't believe you let Evan get away with that Dan Arnold slander. <laughs> tight ends, come on. <laughs> no, Dan Arnold, Dan Arnold, man. You, you yeah, know. they were running out like Daryl Daniels and, and, and Max Williams, Williams and that's, that's like Keyshawn Johnson and Trent Sherfield, <laughs> and I mean, they, some of these dudes yeah. aren't, aren't even in the league anymore. Larry right. Fitzgerald was their tight end. <laughs> yeah, yeah essentially, but. I, I do think Kyler Murray deserves to be, uh, you know, number three. He's number three in my rankings. I'm basically tied with Lamar Jackson right now. But, you know, the theme with these top six QBs, he flashed his QB1 upside last year. Um, he was QB1 weeks one through nine. And he said that he, he thinks he had his uh, shoulder injured in that week nine game against the Dolphins. So, you know, weeks 10 through 17, he was QB10 playing with that hurt shoulder. So I'm going to cut him some slack there, but we already saw when he was healthy that he has QB one potential. You know, I think he's going to build even more chemistry with Hopkins in year two. Um, I, I don't like the AJ, AJ green signing at all, but if anything, it could unlock Christian Kirk's potential if they kick him inside and he'll, you know uh, you know, his natural position is a slot. So I think we could see a breakout year from Kirk. I love the Rondell Moore pick. Um, you know, they love to throw screens to receivers and he has that make you miss ability, just get the ball in his hand. So he could be a yak monster that can help Kyler out as, you know, an extension of the run game. So, you know, I think Kyler Murray has shown his QB one upside. That's why I'm, I'm just having him and Lamar in the sort of mini QB uh, tier two uh, where the, either one of them has a QB one potential season. So if either one of them fall at a certain point in the draft, more than willing to take either one. Yeah, I, I actually um, do like Kyler uh, above Lamar as well. I um, mean, that's just because it, it's a it's a volume thing. I think, Evan, as you mentioned, they can both challenge for the league lead among quarterbacks in rushing. But I don't think we've seen Kyler's full potential as a passer. Uh, I don't know that the Ravens can consistently get enough volume um, passing to kind of offset the fact that I think their rushing kind of ceilings are, are, are similar. So last year, the Cardinals were 15th in, in pass attempts. The year before, they were 18th. Baltimore, 32nd uh, both years. So, um, Evan, you're high in Lamar. Uh, talk, to, talk to us about him and why you're so, uh, so bullish on him. Yeah, so his rushing floor is just, like, uh, unrivaled. So, you know, last year, I mean, I don't even think he had the best season, um, and he was, like, quarterback 10. I mean, he's, you know, he's going to be – He's a high floor guy and he, and he, and he finished strong. Um, he, they, they really did kind of struggle early in the year there. Uh, but, and, and I mean, Mark Andrews, I thought did not have his best season by, you know, by, by a long shot. I think that he can, he can improve. They go out, use a first round pick on Rashad Bateman. Sammy Watkins is sort of like, um, you know, a, a savvy veteran that, that can give them some credit. I mean, they, again, they, they were relying heavily on like Miles Boykin last year. Um, they lost Ronnie Stanley. He'll be back. Uh, I love the addition of Kevin Zeitler. Again, a lot of continuity in the coaching staff with Greg Roman coming back. Um, just the floor there is, is rock solid, I think, with Lamar. And, you know, the, he's, he's also a quarterback that has really excelled when his team has uh, had the lead. And, um, you know, they've finished number one in point differential in each of the last two years. I think they're going to be really good again. Their win total is 10 and a half. I think they're going to beat that. I mean, week one, again, how are they only four and a half point favorites against the Raiders? I took right. that the minute I saw it. Like, that, I, I might have even got it at like move. four. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's Osmaker, like. What's the deal here? Ray, well, Ray and I were, we think they were factoring just the slight chance that Aaron Rodgers mm -hmm. might get traded to oh. the Raiders. But that I, I don't think the chances are high enough to even impact the spread. So I don't know why they had it that low. I was thinking that maybe they were thinking that the club that they they're installing oh, at the yeah. new stadium, like, you know, they, they're going to be rocking out and that's going to give them, you know, a, a big advantage on the field. I don't know. Yeah, not paying attention to the football game. <laughs> yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, Evan, the only thing I'll say that, that I disagreed with in that whole statement was that Sammy Watkins was going to help at all. I think he's like as useless as Boykin at this stage in his career. Like if he wasn't getting it done, with all that coverage going the other way in KC, I, I just, I don't see it here, but I That's do fair. like what you said about, he actually is one of the few quarterbacks that can play and, and, and be effective from a fantasy standpoint with a lead. Um, because a lot of times you see quarterbacks where they really get that extra boost is, um, you know, in, in these kind of shootout games that, you know, maybe they have a tough schedule, you know, even a guy like Brady, you know, you have to go against teams like New Orleans and, and things like that. But um, uh, Jackson can play well with a lead. Uh, so I think that really helps 
um, his floor. Sean, what do you, what do you, where are you on, on Lamar? Yeah, I'm buying the dip on Lamar this year. Um, you know, he was a huge disappointment last year and he finished as a QB eight. So uh, again, with this theme, all these guys have QB one potential here. He showed it in 2019. And we have to remember, you know, ADP stands for average draft position. I've been in plenty of drafts where Dak Prescott was taken ahead of Lamar Jackson. So, you know, if he falls to you at QB five or even QB six, I've had a couple of drafts, like you take him. Um, so, you know, th this offense, I agree. Sammy Watkins probably won't change much, but Rashad Bateman could. I think if one of these guys step up, uh, it's going to help a guy like Marquise Boykin out. I think he'll benefit from, you know, not Marquise being... Brown. Yeah. Oh yeah. Marquise Brown. Will <laughs> it's like that's, that's, that would have just been a, a, a disaster. Uh, a Marquise, Marquise Boykin. Marquise Brown is in his third year. That used to be the year everybody thought that the wide receivers would take their yeah. step forward. You know, it's yeah. two, Mar it's way, two a lot of times now, a lot of yeah. times you see it. Cause, cause like, Absolutely. it's just the reps. It's like receipt, like right. teams are throwing, two thirds of the time. So you get, you're running so many routes that rookie year and in practice that yeah. year too, you kind of, but sorry to cut yeah. you off. Uh, Sean. Yeah. I love Marquise Brown this year. You know, Greg Roman has even said he wants to expand the offense and attack downfield more. Um, so, you know, Lamar should have a bounce back here as a passer in 2021. So like I said, I, I consider him in that tier two with Kyler uh, and Lamar. All right, let's go to, let's go to Dak now. Cause Dak is, I mean, He's all sorts of interesting. And, and Evan, you kind of hit on it at the top. He's coming off an injury, uh, a pretty nasty one, but one that I think we're expecting him to make a full recovery. Um, but I, I, that may be burying the weed because before he had this injury, uh, 450 yards passing, uh, one touchdown, but then three more on the ground uh, against Atlanta. The next game, 472 yards passing, three scores. Uh, and then... Uh, Cleveland, 502 yards passing, four scores. I, I mean, Evan, like, how are you balancing the injury with the upside of Dak just going bonkers because Dallas can't play defense? Yeah, the, the table is set, isn't it? Amari's <laughs> back, Gallup's back, you know, Jarwin's back from his injury. CeeDee Lamb could be, I mean, CeeDee Lamb could go off this year. You know, I, he every time I look at my, my wide receiver rankings, I'm like, man, I, can, I, I need to nudge him up a little bit more because he, I mean, he's an absolute baller. Um, you know, the, the old line is back in the, in the reserves, you know, the backups got the experience now. So they go like nine deep with guys that have started like, you know, six games or more in the NFL. Uh, I, I like what Kellen Moore has done. Um, and, and, and I mean, we, and Dak Prescott has that, that rushing ability too, that we talked about it at the top. Now, will it be the same following this injury? Will he start slow? You know, if he's not confident on on his leg, um, that that's that's the the conundrum to me is is truly what you just asked, Chris. Uh, you know, how do you balance the injury? God, that injury was painful. I I, rem I can still picture myself watching it on TV and you know sitting here with a ton of Dallas stacks in in FFPC and just like you know it, it's over. You know, it's over right now. And I may be having a little bit of, of personal bias because of that, because just watching that and seeing my, my fantasy season essentially go down the tubes on that injury, truly, you know, I, I might have some personal bias here, but I mean, it was a severe injury. And so that to me is, is keeping him out of the first tier. But I mean, I have no, there's no doubt in my mind that he is a first tier caliber scorer. And if he can put this injury behind him, uh, the Cowboys could absolutely lead the NFL in points. Don't worry on deck. Yeah, I'm not too concerned about his injury. Um, you know, from a you know fantasy standpoint, like he he might run a little bit less to start the season, but he's never been you know like a Lamar or Kyler type of run, runner. So I'm a little bit less concerned. If anything, he'll throw more. But again, with this theme that these guys have QB one upside, he was QB one uh, weeks one through four last year before he got injured. Um, obviously those 422 passing yards per game are unsustainable. Um, but you know, he, he has arguably the best trio of wide receivers in the game. Um, and I think, you know, Evan mentioned it, like the sky's the limit with CD lamb. He, for some reason, he was only averaging 65 to 70% of routes run per game. They were mixing in guys like Cedric Wilson and Noah Brown, which is just absolutely ridiculous. So, you know, we're going to get CD lamb, hopefully over 90% of routes run per game. That's going to help Dak out. He gets Blake Jarwin back. 
We saw Dalton Schultz can step up if needed. So I just love this offense. So that's why I have Dak still as my QB five, even if his rushing stats go down a little bit, I still think that the passing upside's just enormous in this offense. Yeah, I, 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 it comes back to me just to that defense. I don't, I know they made some changes. I don't know how much better it's going to be. Um, and that gives me confidence because the first few years, Dak's entire career, actually, um, he actually had a, uh, above average defense until last year. Like it wasn't a terrible defense, even maybe if it was kind of nondescript and all of a sudden it really fell off a cliff. We saw the numbers go crazy. So um, the injury, it's hard at this point for me to, to, to dock him too much. You just have to kind of assume he'll make a full recovery. Um, but if we start hearing things that are worrisome, you know, as we get closer to camp or he doesn't, or I mean, closer to the season and he doesn't look right um, if, if he gets any action um, it, it, heading into it, then, then maybe you knock him down. But I think he still deserves to be um, in that number five spot. Evan, I, like it starts to get interesting after, after Dak, because you have Justin Herbert, Russell Wilson, Aaron Rodgers in the six through eight spots by ADP um, with Herbert recently jumping Wilson. Um, where are you on, on Herbert compared to that, you know, compared to Dak and then compared to Wilson and Rodgers? Yeah, so I've got Dak five and then a little bit of a gap and then Russ and then Herbert like right next to each other and then Jalen Hurts at quarterback eight a little bit further down the board. Um, I, I, I think that Russ, uh, Russ, like before he retires, he, this dude better get an MVP. I mean, he's been so yes. close a couple of times. He, you remember, he, he like had it in the bank through 12 weeks last year or, or something like that. And then, you know, they, he threw a few interceptions and, and then Pete Carroll was like, no, we're going to hand the ball to DJ Dallas 30 times a game, you know, <laughs> like just totally sunk his season. Um, and he, he didn't play very well down the stretch, but um, I, I really like the addition of, of Shane Waldron, the new OC who they, they know very well, having played against him for multiple seasons uh, as, you know, the, the former uh, Rams passing game coordinator. And he's been talking a lot about up-tempo playing up tempo. There's no quarterback in the league. I like to watch more play with urgency than Russell Wilson. So let's get this pl dude playing up tempo, you know, DK Metcalf or, and Tyler Lockett are both back. They add Dwayne Eskridge in the second round, maybe kind of a reach, but you know, a guy who gives them a, a little bit of playmaking potential. Gerald Everett follows over, uh, follows uh, uh, Shane Waldron over from the Rams and Gerald Everett I mean, he's been, you know, a, a potential ridden sort of maybe a little bit of an underachiever for, for years now, but, but a, definitely a great athlete has had some really big games specifically against Seattle. Um, and I think that that might've been one of the reasons that they were encouraged to, to draft him or to, to, uh, to pick him up. And then Gabe Jackson on the offensive line, uh, you know, he's like a 330 pound dude, but he's better at pass blocking than run blocking. So I, I, I like, I like their off season, man. And I, I don't believe the, the early off season rhetoric that they want to take the air out of the ball. I, I think that they're going to be more aggressive than we think. I think indications have, have started to begun to point that way. Russell Wilson has been talking about it publicly. And um, I, I think Russell Wilson, you know, I, I think he's, he's, a, you know, you, you put a little, you sprinkle a little bit on him for MVP like every year, but especially this year, I think you can still get him at like 16 or 20 to one. Yeah, and I think it's like as you mentioned, Evan. The it was like the the defense too. I think last year because he didn't play well down the stretch, and it was kind of at the same time that the defense came together. Remember, they had that stretch like I think it was the last seven eight weeks where they didn't average, they didn't give up. Uh, I think it was more than like twenty three points in any game, or, or they only did it once. So like defense was playing better. Um, you know, Russ was struggling, but if you look at his numbers, five out of the past six seasons. Uh, he's gotten to, to, to 30 plus touchdowns, you know, 40 last year um, for the past six, he's gotten to 4,000 yards. So, um, you know, I think he's kind of, uh, he deserves, in my opinion, to be above um, Herbert, just based off that. Um, and because, you know, there's just more consistency there. Now I do think Herbert has the, the chance to, to play more shootouts. Um, so Sean, I'll ask you this, like whether Russ cooks, or doesn't and like you can give your opinion on that but does it even matter like does it even matter if they're more aggressive because it seems like they we've been clamoring for this every year and it's just like 30 35 touchdowns and and, and, and over four thousand yards well yeah of course it matters because last year we saw 
weeks one through eight when they let him cook, he was QB one. And then Evan already mentioned he fell off a cliff um, in the second half. But in the end, he was QB six. And that really does feel like his floor. So that's why I have him in a mini tier three with Dak Prescott, where I think that's the end of guys that have legit QB one potential. Now, the, the person saying the way of this, of course, is Pete Carroll. But I, I really do think, you know, Shane Waldron could, you know, shield Russ from that a bit. And this is going to be an up-tempo offense. And I love investing in DK Metcalf this year. You know, he's entering year three. He's going to be a monster this year. So I'm fine taking Russell Wilson as the sixth QB off the board. I have a big enough gap between him and Herbert where I do think there's a tier divide. Um, but, you know, we saw the first half of last season, what happens if you do let Russ cook. And like you said, it, it had a lot to do with the defense. The defense did get a lot better. Um, so that played into it. But I think this year they do let him pass a bit more. All right, Evan, um, talk to me about Herbert, because uh, you, you have him after Russ, right? So um, is, there, is there a big gap like with Sean or you, have, they're, they're, you, you said they're kind of neck and neck for you. Talk to me about like, what you think um, is going to come of him in year two. You know, Anthony Wynn is now gone, but he had a really impressive uh, rookie year. Oh, yeah. No, yeah, I have him pretty much back to back in, in, in overall rankings. Um, I, you know, he, he can run. Uh, he's a really good athlete. He was supposed to be uh, sort of a conservative passer coming out of Oregon. That was like the draft Twitter take on him. He was clearly just a product of the Oregon system and the fact that who has Oregon produced like an NFL pass catcher in like, you know, the last half decade. I mean, can you name one? There, there was a seventh round pick of, of the Vikings and he's out of the league a couple of years ago. DeAnthony Thomas, you know, I mean, that was like a long time ago. Um, I mean, like, can you even name one? I, I can't. Yeah. Um, so he was surrounded with a whole lot of nothing at Oregon and just throwing a bunch of dump off passes that these little scrubs could catch. And now he gets to the NFL. He's like, yo, let, let's roll. Although he, he did throw a lot of short passes to Keenan Allen, but he, but he was aggressive going down the field to Mike Williams. They, they didn't have show a lot, a lot of chemistry in year one, but I think that they will, I think that'll start to, to connect a little bit in year two. Um, I mean, I just – oh, and their offensive line improvements were major. Well, for the coaching staff and the offensive line improvements are, are things that, you know, really, really stand out. Being able to steal Rashawn Slater uh, at the 13th overall pick, some people thought he might go, like, top seven. Um, you know, signing uh, Matt Filer, who's been, like, a steady uh, left guard slash tackle uh, for the Steelers. Um, you know, uh, signing Corey Lindsley from the Packers, a stud center, getting back Brian Bulaga healthy. All of a sudden you have four solid offensive linemen. And I mean, Phillip Rivers went 15 years without having four solid offensive linemen before Justin Herbert came along. So uh, I, you know, I, there is some fear of the unknown. I mean, we're, there's a lot of change going on here. You know, I talked about the continuity with some of the dudes up top, like Josh Allen and Mahomes has a, a solid amount of continuity. Lamar Jackson has a solid amount of continuity. Justin Herbert doesn't have a whole lot of continuity. And so, you know, some, there's like a voice in the back of my mind, like, could this guy take a step back in year two? And so there is some fear of the unknown, but that's just trying to examine the, the whole spectrum of potential outcomes. Um, Cause I mean, I, I, I love the kid. The kid was out there balling and he's got pimples, you know, he's, he's <laughs> yeah. like the only player in the only quarterback in the NFL with like legit acne and I mean, he's so young and he was out there slinging. He, he was a lot of fun to watch last year. Yeah, um, man. That's, Fade, that's Fade Herbert and negative five points for his that league, right? Great. <laughs> <laughs> hey, maybe he wears makeup, man. You don't know, man. He might want to, you know, get a little concealer on when he goes out. But uh, Sean, I mean, Evan mentioned it. That's really the only concern where Herbert is just like the unknown, right? Because uh, from my vantage point, exceeded expectations in year one. And I look at this defense. I mean, yes, you're going to have Bosa back, but there's a lot of turnover on the defense to where I'm not like, they lost a lot of talent, even though it was guys that probably had to go like, like Hayward. I mean, their starters at corner, are what Campbell and, and, and Davis and the rookie now and, and Samuel and, you know, Derwin James coming back, but how good is he going to be? Um, you know, linebacker, you've lost a lot of these past couple of years. Uh, so, I, I mean, 
Am Melvin I wrong Ingram's for thinking that there's going to be some shootouts? Melvin yeah. Melvin Ingram's gone. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, like, am I wrong thinking there's going to be some shootouts? And, like, what do you think of, like, be. turnover? No, yeah, I think that that's, that's his ceiling, right, as if the defense takes a step back. Duran James gets hurt in week one again. Like, that's going to be a ceiling season from him. And, you know, I think long term, like, this offense will be better under Joe Lombardi. I think he's going to get the most out of Austin Eckler. He's going to get the most out of Mike Williams. Um, I think Jared Cook is a – solid you know short-term replacement for hunter henry so i'm not too worried about that um but you know evan mentioned it, the continuity you know heading into year two he might get off to a slow start so while, while this is probably better long term we, he could have some bumps early in the season so that's essentially why i still think russell wilson's a tier above i just think russ has a higher floor ceiling combo whereas you know herbert obviously there's a lot of potential there what's not to like the offensive line is gonna be better but just uh, I like a guy like Russ, where if this offense does click and they have, you know, a more pass heavy attack, I think Russ is a better bet um, for, you know, top five numbers. Yeah. And that's actually a great point. When you said that I looked, I looked up the schedule and the first week, the Chargers are at Washington. That's a tough defense. Yeah. And, then, and that's across the country. I mean, you, you, can you even start Justin Herbert? Nope. In, in, in nope. a 12, in a 12 team. <laughs> no, I don't think so. No. I, I mean, oddsmaker, where would you have him ranked that week? Probably like 15 or. Probably not that low. He'd probably okay. still be a fringe, maybe like QB 12 or 13. Okay. But yeah, he's, you definitely have to downgrade him at Washington. Yeah, Would I'm unequivocally not. Would you Fitzpatrick yeah. over right. Justin Herbert in week one? As oh, they, as God. They uh, I, I think I would stick with Herbert there, but All it's right. probably closer than people think. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, I, I think I would. I, I'm the Washington defense is like one of those defenses that's on my list of just do not fuck with this defense. Like, it's just, like, yeah. I'm just not going to do it. And, like, matchups are overrated, I think, in fantasy in general. And we could probably spend a whole uh, episode talk and more talking about that. But um, at quarter, quarterbacks still are the most, most predictable um, positions. Um, you know, they're getting the most reps against certain matchups. So, like, that Washington defense, I mean, they have it, they have it all. They have passwords. They have everything. I, I wouldn't mess with it. Um, I think you're drafting Herbert, you're drafting him starting in week two against Dallas, and then they're, they're going to Arrowhead in week three. That's a tough, you know, place to play and a tough defense to play at home uh, in Arrowhead. But, but, it, but it could be 40 to 30. Right. It could be a shootout. Then you got the Raiders. Then you get the Browns who will be improved. But like, yeah. it's a tough schedule. I mean, you got the Browns and the Ravens defenses who should be improved in five and six. So you could have a, a kind of not a QB six worthy first and then there's a buy uh i believe in week seven so you could you could start herbert and you're in week eight and you may have only gotten like two to three quality starts out of him so that is something to think about i, I think when, when you're going to draft justin herbert and i think that's where kind of okay you're looking at some of these other guys and their upside in and evan i know you have hurts above aaron Rodgers, and um i, I do want to talk about because i love that call but i i'm just going to go in order of the adp here so let's talk about Rodgers, like uh, in, my, in the outline, I have written down quarterback eight, Aaron Rodgers. What the fuck? So tell me what the fuck? Like, what, I what, mean, what I, do we do I, with him? I think it's really simple to lay this out. Like, I, I'm not fully confident that he's going to be there week one. Uh, I don't, I had a friend in town and we were just hanging out all weekend. So I didn't, I wasn't like intensely studying the news. Um, but I, I thought I saw uh, a, a report from Schefter that said that Aaron Rodgers still not planning to report week one. And then I saw a bunch of garbage on social media, like, you know, so he liked something on, on, on Twitter. So that makes, means he's going to be back, you know, like, so I don't know. I kind of yeah. tend to trust Schefter over that kind of stuff. Uh, so that, that's, that's where I'm at right now. I, I mean, you know, the guy just got married. He, he clearly does, doesn't feel great about making, the Packers management and their fake owner, Mark Murphy and Brian Gutekunst, their GM making these guys rich. And, um, you know, he could go be the host of Jeopardy and hang out with his new wife. And I mean, he's like sort of an intellectual guy, Carson Palmer, is sort of an intellectual guy. And he, he did, you know, he kind of did, he kind of did that and forced his way out. So I certainly wouldn't put it past Aaron Rodgers. And, and if he did it more, more power to him, take a year off and, come back and play a couple more years for, you know, in, in a situation that you, you actually feel comfortable in. Yeah. Andrew Luck was another cerebral quarterback yes. that retired young. Yep. So let me ask both of you. Barry Sanders is a real cerebral guy. Calvin Johnson <laughs> even is, I think. Yeah. 
Yeah. I, I, I was just going to ask, uh, starting with you, Evan, Aaron Rodgers, he's a QB8 by ADP right now, he's, but it's all over the place. You're in a high-stakes league, uh, starting one quarterback. Uh, how far does Aaron Rodgers have to fall, um, given what we know now, for you to take him? Well, you know, the reality is also that he could go back to scoring like he did in the previous four seasons before last year. I mean, the recency bias is really strong here, and it seems like a virtual lock that he's going to come back and produce like that. But he had not played like that in, in a while. Um, and, and they really didn't do a whole lot to, to upgrade his receiving core again, did they? I mean, they've got what uh, uh, they added Amari Rogers. Funches and, coming uh, back. Oh, yeah. Big Funches. <laughs> I mean, that's the difference right there, right? Uh, I mean, they, they didn't really do a whole lot to, to help him again. So um, I, 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 I wouldn't take him. I just let somebody else take him. Sean, would you take him? Or how, and how far would you let him fall um, before you did? If he fell to me like QB 12, I would consider it. There's just too much uncertainty right now. And, you know, if I had to bet, I would say that he's going to be Sean? Uh-oh. Hey, you heard that too, right? Yeah. Sean just like he's froze. Frozen. He's frozen. Sean, you're frozen, bro. That he takes us in. Was a nine... Hey, oh, Sean? Shit. You're, you yeah. were frozen for that whole – so just say that whole thing over because you were frozen uh, for like the entire – My is unstable. Okay. Um, I'm for this to be the Aaron Rodgers portion. Uh, <laughs> right. It's also, like the Aaron Rodgers. Do he, he heard you. He heard you. He knows I've been dissing him in it. Evan dissed him for the past – like the past – in the past four years, and he was just like mm. – All right. And well, I got the Brett Favre on right now too. Oh, so. yeah. Well, you have to explain that. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, okay. So go go. just start your takeover, and at the end I'll, I'll throw it – I'll tie it everything. Tie everything. Yeah, I think that Rodgers would have to fall to like QB 12 for me to consider him just because there's, there's a lot of uncertainty right now. Um, if I had to bet on it, I would say he's going to, you know, start week one for the Packers, but there's just too many different um, scenarios where he, he either sits out in the season or, you know, sits out the entire season. We don't really know. Um, but, but aside from that, you know, Evan mentioned it, he, he could regress to what we saw the previous few seasons. He had a 9.1, touchdown percentage last year so that's that's unsustainable that's going to come down um I actually do like the Mario Rogers pick I think he could be a potential Randall Cobb replacement something they've been missing the past couple seasons but just when it comes to drafting uh quarterbacks in this range there's just no reason to take them um I, I think you can take a guy like uh Cooper Cup or you know Chris Carson you know key guys at, at critical positions where you, you don't have many backup plans after uh, Rogers, so I would just punt Rogers completely, but he would have to fall like pretty late, like QB twelve uh, for me to consider him. Yeah, I think I would. I would take him. I'll put it this way: it depends on the week size, but I wouldn't take him as my intended starting quarterback right now. So, like, I guess you know, twelve team league, if he falls, you know, past QB thirteen or something like that, I, I take a shot on him. I think he he has enough upside to warrant using a roster spot on your bench. Uh, to hold him because he could give you QB one up. That that's another guy with QB one upside. I mean, you know, even though he doesn't have, uh, he has a, a much lower floor. But um, that, that's just how I'm kind of looking at it. Um, and almost forgot. Um, sounds like sounds like you're not going to be getting him, Rayvon. Yeah, no, I'm not. You're but not you never know. That's what I'm just saying for people out there because a lot of people are going to listen to the show and they're going to hear you know Evan Silva saying I'm not taking him. They're going to hear Sean Kerner say. I'm not taking him to QB 12 and maybe he does his AP does drop a little no, bit. So I'm like a level headed okay. stance. If you just look at the board, QB 12 is like the perfect spot really, because it's like, yeah. then you start to get into like Tannehill Stafford, Baker Mayfield, mm -hmm. you know, like guys that you pretty much know. I mean, they can have good weeks, but they're probably, they're not, you're not going to be able to start them every week, you know? So, Ooh. I mean, I don't know, like, but I like, what about like Trey Lance? I mean, Trey Lance could light this up in, in year one. I know he's, we're talking about top 12 quarterbacks here, but those kind of guys are, you know, really interesting. Justin Fields, uh, I think even Trevor Lawrence, these guys have a chance to, to, to finish in the top 12, all of them. Yeah, if you can run and, you know, if you can run at, at, and you're going to start, it's just how, how many starts are you going to make? You know, that, that's really the only thing. It's kind of like, I mean, we even saw it with Taysom Hill. Um, we saw it with Jalen Hurts. We saw it the year before at Lamar. It's like, if you can move around, you're going you're gonna to be able to put up points. Um, so yeah, I don't think I, I definitely don't think you reach on Rodgers. I don't think you take him at ADP. 
Um, what so, about Deshaun Watson? Oh God. Ooh, he's you know he's not even in the outline because he's not on the top twelve. But uh, what, what what are your thoughts on Deshaun um, Evan? Real quick. I mean, I it's there's been like no news on him for a really long time. You know, there's been like no developments. So I, my assumption has been so he had no to be going to the guy, spa. No way this guy's playing, but uh, there's been no you know suspension suspension announcement. There's been no. I don't, I don't want to get into it because I, I'm not an expert at all in that area, but uh, it, it, there's been no news recently. Maybe we'll get some as, as training camp starts. I'll, make, I'll ask you this then real quick on Deshaun, just like uh, give me, throw out me, throw me out of probability uh, odds that Deshaun Watson finishes as a top 12 quarterback, given all we know right now. No clue. I would, I put it at like, 15% range, 15 to 20%. So I'm staying away from him. But like when it comes to best ball, if you can get him as your QB three, he seems like a no brainer, but um, there, there's just a ton of uncertainty there and it shows in his ADP. Um, but yeah, I feel like the past couple of years, I need a law degree and uh, epidemiology degree <laughs> to figure out these, these odds. But um, yeah, th this is, uh, past my expertise at this. So I, I've been avoiding him unless it's like, you know, a best ball draft where you can get him super, super late. All right, let's move on to Tom Brady. He's a QB nine. I know you, uh, Evan, you like Jalen Hurts ahead of Brady too. Um, but what, what did you expect from Brady this year? I mean, I guess the question is just how long can he keep doing this? Right. I think he'll be solid. I, I think he'll be, you know, he's not going to give you anything with his legs. Uh, Godwin and Evans both experienced, uh, injuries at time they didn't miss a ton of combined games god would miss four i don't think Edmonds missed that any or he might have missed one uh but they, they should be back healthier gronk i think you know he looked better as the season progressed and then in the super bowl he looked awfully good so you know maybe and he's still only 32 i mean people think he's like 40 he's 32 years old like that's pretty young um you know the entire offensive line back I, you know, he's, he's right on that, on that QB nine to QB, QB 12 fringe, I think, but at the top of it, uh, because he's going to throw a lot of touchdown passes and it, it's, and it's Mike Evans has been, you know, Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, Rob Gronkowski, Antonio Brown, who I think is actually a great middle round pick this year. I see odd, odds maker shaking his head, but all these guys have been like above well above expectation touchdown rate scorers throughout their career. So I, I mean, I think Tom Brady is going to be rock solid uh, and he's going to throw a lot of touchdown passes. You know, I, I really have developed a bias for drafting quarterbacks that can move. And so I don't think I'm going to end up personally with a ton of them, but I mean, you, you can build solid stack. Mike Evans isn't terribly expensive this year. Godwin is, um, you know, right around wide receiver 20. I think that's not terribly expensive. Gronk is, is very cheap. Um, and, and Brady isn't, you know, overly expensive either. So, I mean, you, you could try to build like a buck stack. I just, I, I lean toward the, the movement quarterbacks. Yeah. I, I, I also have to, to take Hertz over Brady and then it starts to get, um, you know, cloudy. Um, and another guy will talk about uh, Tannehill shortly, but, but Sean, um, any th any quick thoughts on Brady? Just um, you know, what what do you kind of expect out of him uh, yeah, this year in I, relation to those guys? I, I can't hate anybody that gets him QB nine. I feel like we can't really underestimate his ceiling this year. Uh, and apparently, he's playing with a torn MCL last year as well. Uh, but it's just incredible what he did after spending a couple decades in an offense, um, and then going to Tampa Bay and doing that. You know, I I have flashbacks of when Peyton Manning did that. He went to Denver. First season, he was really good. You know, 47 yards and 37 touchdowns. And Second then the next year, season was way was better. 5,500 <laughs> yards and 55 yeah. touchdowns. So I'm saying, like, don't underestimate Brady's potential for that. Because I was shaking my head when Evan was talking about these receivers, the tight ends. They brought in Gio Bernard. Like, <laughs> everything's there for Brady to just have a monster season. So if, if you yeah. get him at uh, QB9, you know, I'm not going to make fun of that. I, I think. And, and, and people talk about, you know, hey, they're bringing back 22 of 22 starters. Look at the depth that they have at the skill positions. They've got, you know, not just those frontline guys, but they've got like Tyler Johnson, who mm. you know might be a starting slot receiver caliber player in the league. Scotty Miller, who had some really big games in the first half of last year after Antonio, after uh, and then Antonio Brown came off suspension, and then Scotty Miller kind of faded. 
Cameron Brait, who's been, you know, a pro. And O.J. Howard's coming back. Um, they drafted this kid, Jalen Durden, uh, yeah. who made – he scored 19 touchdowns in nine games last year at North Texas. 19 receiving touchdowns in nine games. He's small, yeah. but he's fast. And he scored – I mean, touchdown scoring is good. You, you guys like, love touchdowns like I do, right? Yes, yes. yes. And – so I think the, the, the only potential for concern is, you know, he might finally have a decline at 44, but I'm not betting against him anytime soon. But also this Bucks defense, you know, it's elite. So it, it could prevent shootouts. That's one of the concerns is this defense is so good that he might not have to put up 35, 40 points often. So that's, that's the only thing that I think would hinder his ceiling is this defense is so good. Yeah. And like, I mean, the thing that, that I think is for me, it's like always, a lot of times quarterbacks, it's not like a gradual decline if you make it this far because there's like a survivorship bias. So it's kind of like you're doing good and then all of a sudden you're just done. Like like Peyton Manning, it, it kind of just hit him all in one season. But the thing for me with Brady, he passes the eye test. Like even Breeze, you could kind of see the end coming. You know, the arm strength wasn't there. Um, Manning, you knew he had the injury. It was just when was it going to start affecting him? But Brady passes the eye test. He hasn't had a, a, any significant injury to the you know shoulder arm area. Like, you know, he had the MCL last year. So, it, like, it doesn't feel like the year that he's going to drop off a cliff. So, um, I, it's not a sexy pick for me there at, at QB9, but um, I'll make him if he falls. Uh, but but let's talk about Jalen Hurts because I know, I mean, you have him up at number eight. Um, and I really love that. Uh, I love Hurts this year. I think he has that Lamar Jackson MVP type year in him, that that jump. Do, do, you, do you see that kind of ceiling uh, for Jalen Hurts, Evan? Yeah, I bet him uh, real early in the offseason, like 100 to 1 MVP, then 80 to 1 MVP, 60 to 1 MVP. I think he got up to like 40 to 1 or maybe 50 to 1. Um, either way, I'm not betting that anymore. But uh, <laughs> he was, <laughs> but I mean, I, 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 that's how I kind of envision it as a Lamar Jackson potential uh, situation where he could just run for a ton of yards because the Eagles are, are get, they're kind of like in the Dallas situation where they're getting back you know, most, if not all of their offensive line. And then the backups got experience last year and they're bringing in uh, Nick Sirianni as the head coach. And he had some really successful running games in Indianapolis. Um, I just, I think they could have a potentially dominant rushing attack. And then he's got, I mean, he's, he's got some big, I, I think he's got some accuracy concerns, but, uh, and I, he's had those for a really long time since he really entered college football. I remember watching him play like, as a young player at Alabama and he wound up transferring um, to Oklahoma and lighting, lighting it on fire uh, under, under Lincoln Riley, but he's never been the, the most accurate passer, but he's like been a big play passer. And, you know, you've got Jalen Rieger, the first round pick coming back Dallas Goddard. I mean, I think the ceiling is, you know, is really, really high for him. Um, Travis Fulham flashed last year and then Devonte Smith, you know, won the Heisman and the Blitnikoff award. You know, if everything goes right, then I think that Jalen Hurts could have a really, really big statistical season. Um, I don't, I don't know about him winning MVP. You know, they they probably have to get like ten win. They probably have to go like ten and seven, I would say for and and then he'd have to absolutely crush it. But um, yeah, that's kind of where I am with Jalen Hurts. Uh, the, this the ceiling is really high because of his dual threat ability and then if if they can somehow stay healthy they've been like the most injured team you know one of the five most injured teams in the league for the past three or four years yeah it's, it's possible I mean the Giants have no quarterback the Cowboys have no defense the Eagles could kind of sneak up in the second place maybe if they get a playoff spot and, and Jalen Hurts has like a Lamar type season I think he has a really good shot uh, at winning an MVP uh, Sean what are your thoughts on Hurts yeah, I th his rushing upside uh, seems like a lock at this point. Um, and you mentioned it, you know, he has a non-zero chance to have a Lamar Jackson 2019 or a Josh Allen 2020 sort of breakout season as a passer. Um, so I, he's the only quarterback outside of the top six, I think is really worth, you know, a gamble at ADP because you're, you're potentially getting a top three quarterback if he just plays up to his potential. Um, and even if he crashes and burns, he won't kill you. And you'll probably know right away he'll either be hurt or benched. So, um, you know, he's not going to just – you're not going to have to stick with him all season. Um, so I think he's the guy outside of the top six I'm willing to roll the dice on. Just because, like, when we were making projections at the end of last season, he was in our top three every week. Um, and, you know, I, I don't see anything – any reason to think he'll 
regress. They added Devonta Smith. I think, you know, Jalen Rager could break out near two as being, you know, the number two receiver. They won't, they don't have to rely on him as the number one. I think there's a lot of potential in this offense. So I, I love taking Hertz at ADP right now. Yeah. I think, I think you really, it's, you know, after Dak, um, I could see, I could even see Hertz as high as five. Um, I wouldn't, I, I like the consistency of Wilson. And, and I think we're getting a little, we know a little more about Dak and, and, and Herbert, you know, I could, could be primed to explode, but I don't really see how you take Rodgers or Brady, to be honest, over, over Jalen Hurts at this point. And it's even tough, probably even to take Herbert o- over Hurts, considering, um, you know, they're both young guys. Um, I, I really like the, the rushing production is a lot. And it, it, it's because scramble um, frequency is one of the most sticky predictive stats that we have year to year, uh, any position um, and, and Hertz scrambled 13.5% of dropbacks last year. Um, and that's a ridiculously high rate. And this is not even counting, uh, you know, design runs and things like that. So you scramble, you know, m- more than once every 10 dropbacks. And that's the same like yardage as a pass attempt. You know, you're usually getting six, seven, eight yards per scramble on average. Um, so those are extremely valuable. Uh, love Jalen Hurts uh, this year. So that's, that's, that I do agree. I think that's the guy that, like, like last year, we were targeting Josh Allen in those middle rounds. It wasn't necessarily a full late round strategy. Uh, for me, it's Hurts this year. Um, but I do want to move on to these last two guys, and in particular, Ryan Tannehill, QB 11 ADP. Evan, I really struggle with him, so I'm, I'm really curious as to what you're going to say, and, and Sean as well, because I feel like I, it's always hard to rank him. He, you always feel like you have him too low. Then he, he goes out, and it's like automatic three touchdowns. Yeah. Um, but – I have a lot of respect for Arthur Smith. Like I, I wrote a whole piece on the Titans last year. I thought Smith was responsible, is responsible for the turnaround of Tannehill, for the turnaround of that offense, for finally making the pieces fit with Derrick Henry, all built on that play action game. And let's not forget how efficient they are in the red zone as well. I mean, they were automatic in the red zone. Arthur Smith is gone. Julio Jones is here. Right. Is that all set? Like, is, does that, is everything going to be straight and Ryan Tannehill is going to keep being Ryan Tannehill? That's the key question is, um, is the addition of Julio Jones, can that offset? Because we know his on-off splits with Matt Ryan were stark. Um, can, and can his addition offset the loss of Arthur Smith? Can Todd Downing, who has been on staff with the Titans for the past couple of years, you know, just mimic the offense that Arthur Smith put in place? Because Todd Downing had one year as the Raiders OC and he fucking bombed it. Um, so hopefully he can do better, uh, in this situation. They're so thin. I mean, Josh Reynolds was a nice pickup. If Ferkser goes down, like who are they playing at tight end? I I don't, I don't even know. I mean, Michael, is it going to be Michael? I I think Michael is still a free agent. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. They didn't even resign him yet. Oh man. I don't think so. Oh, gee. So is uh, Swain still there? It's got, it's one of these guys. Swain is. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Michael, Michael will be sound before week one and play like 40% of every week snap. So I was like Michael, Michael. (laughs) but, uh, you know, they're, they're really, really thin. They're going to be bad on defense too, by the way, they, their past defense, well, their their entire secondary, but outside of Kevin Byard, they made over in the offseason. It's a bunch of guys that, you know, you don't have a whole lot of faith in. Uh, their pass rush, I mean, their way of addressing that, which was non-existent last year, was by signing Bud Dupree, who is, you know, he's, he's not very good. Um, they're, they were bad on defense last year. They're going to be bad again this year. They're going to end up throwing, I think, a considerably more amount this season it's just, can he parlay the efficiency that he showed under Arthur Smith? I think the answer is an obvious no, but can he parlay, you know, the majority of it into this year? I think his pass attempts rise by like a hundred. Um, and then, you know, can Julio hold up? Can AJ Brown hold up? Cause they're so freaking thin. I mean, again, I like Josh Reynolds as a third receiver. I don't like him very much as a second receiver and they're relying so much on Anthony Ferkser. It's like ridiculous. Yeah, I think it's 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 Todd Downing. The, the question is, is with him is like he's I think he had one year as an OC before this, and he, their team was like 15th in uh, in pass attempts. So, I mean, Sean, you know what what do you see for Tannehill with the with the volume? Is that is that something that is going to rise and is rising in your projections uh, as well? And uh, um, like, is the is there an efficiency drop off for Smith, or is that kind of canceled out by Julio for you? Yeah, I mean. 
Julio has to cancel out, you know, the loss of Arthur Smith, Corey Davis, and Jonu Smith. Mm, mm-hmm. So that's what I'm saying, like, with, with Evan's point of, you know, Julio has to stay healthy. Um, and I don't know if we can bank on that anymore. Last year, he did look like, you know, he's starting to get old and break down a bit. So, you know, if he goes down, it, this is going to be really tough. And I know, Raybon, you and I, we always complain about projecting Ryan Tannehill. It's almost impossible because – you can't project his efficiency to maintain this elite status. I mean, especially with a run heavy offense with Derrick Henry, just the fact that he's able to consistently produce two, t- two or more touchdowns a game, 24 of his 26 starts on the Titans, he's had two or more touchdowns. It just feels unsustainable. So he, I, I think they have to throw more. So if, if Evan's right and they do throw a hundred more times this year, that would be great. And I would be more comfortable taking him at ADP, but I don't know if we could bank on that. So I'm just staying away and just letting him constantly outperform my projections because uh, I can't, I can't bring myself to, to project him, you know, as a top 10 quarterback. So I think his ADP at 11 seems fine. I'm just not going to have much of them there. Well, I want to know where did Raybon, where'd you get this list? Because Joe Burrow should definitely be ahead of Ryan Tannehill. This, so this is the fantasy pros consensus ADP uh, ranks. Wow. And so they are taking, you know, all the sites, some of which I know people are just, uh, you know, mocking probably not as seriously as yeah, other sites. So yeah. yeah um, Drafting you know, we'll, kickers before, you know, <laughs> right. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a little, if I think it generally represents the market consensus, but uh, you know, there's definitely some spots where I think like, even with day one hurts, I think he's too low at 10, um, but Tannehill, at 11 for me, I'm actually okay with it because I do think he still brings some, some something to the table um, rushing wise. You know, he has he had seven rushing scores a year ago. I don't think that continues, but um, you know, 16.6 yards. That's a little more than. Well, hey, that. they call plays for him at the goal yeah. line off these play fakes. You know, to to Derrick Henry. I mean, that, that's like a part <laughs> of their offense. So yeah. I would. I mean, yeah, I'm not a. Yeah, I would still project him for you know four or five this year. Yeah, he's and, not. And he can run. I mean, you know, everyone oh, yeah. forgets he played wide receiver at Texas A and M. Yeah, he's not dead. Like just because you know, I mean, if any, I mean, let's be realistic. I mean, if you're not kind of so dialed in, like like Evan and you are, and Sean, you are, and, and I, if you're not as dialed in, you're not thinking about like offensive coordinators all that hard. Now you should, because Arthur Smith is a really good one. But like on the surface, it's just like okay, Titans defense going to be bad, and they got Julio Jones yeah. like that that's an upgrade in a lot of people's minds. Right. And, and, and it could very well be that I think the Titans have a very volatile range of outcomes um, as a team. And I think that extends to their players. I think if, if the guys, they kind of use to, to turn over the defense, stay healthy, um, you know, they could, they could be a really good team. I think if, if, if Julio stays healthy, if, if they, if they can all set the loss of Smith, high upside team, if everything goes we, wrong we, on the other hand, on all oh, that, I, I want to oh. hear Sean's take on, on Joe Burrow, because the data guys, you know, at, at ETR, Leone and, you know, our, our other guys, they love the Bengals offense so much this year. And, you know, they project, I mean, they're Zach Taylor, you know, he'll, he'll play fast. They have a really high pass rate. You know, they got Tyler Higgins, Jamar Chase, Tyler Boyd. Um, but, I, you know, I, and, and, and I totally get it. And I'm sure it looks great on the spreadsheet. However, you know, they, their offensive line still stinks. And he's coming off an ACL and, and I believe an MCL too. And he's a movement quarterback. You know, he's not Lamar Jackson, but he's, you know, he's, he's like a top 15 athlete at the position across the league. And that's a big part of his game. And it was at, at LSU. I, I don't like that combination. The, the offensive line still, the biggest addition that they made was what Riley Reef, And then they used the second round pick on Jackson Carmen, who wasn't even good uh, in college. And is, is like coming off a back injury, which you hate to see for any offensive lineman. Riley Reef, uh, he also has a history of back injuries. But where are you at on, on Joe Burrow? Yeah, I have him uh, QB 13. Uh, similar concerns with you with, you know, uh, I, I don't think we can bank on, you know, his, his rushing upside hitting the full potential this year. Um, and certainly, you know, he has one of the best trio of receivers. Um, but, you know, at tight end, tight end still pretty weak. You know, he's going to have CJ Uzoma. And, you know, I, I think they're going to lean on Joe Mixon a bit more this year. So I agree. I think that, you know, while Jamar Chase was a sexy pick, I think they probably should have gone with Sewell or just get some offensive line help because you got to keep him healthy, especially after last season. Um, so he sits a top sort of like a pretty big, like five to six 
QB two tier for me. So that's why I'm probably not going to have a ton of him. But I, I love aggressively attacking any one of these th three wide receivers. Like I think all these guys can crush expectations. But Joe Burr himself, I'm not going out of my way to take him this year. I would. I, I think Joe Burr deserves to be above like Brady. I, I, I'm kind of I'm kind of high on Joe Burrow because I think the like injuries are really hard to predict. Like he got hurt last year. He misses the rest of the season. So it's, it's, it's a lot of recency bias. The last image we have of him is him rolling out of the season and out of any roster you had on a cart. But the bottom line is the Bengals have been near the top of the league in passing. AJ green was catching under 50% of his balls. He was averaging what, like four yards a target. And he, he led the team in, in air yards last year, 30% of the air yards went to a player that could not play football anymore. So, I mean, that's going to be a huge difference. Like just, just transferring chase to green's role. And then you factor in the defense may not be great. The team may not be great. Listen, yes, it's, it's a concern. J Burrow would probably like it for them to get an old lineman as well, or, or a better one. Um, if people invested in him may, may have liked that. But at the end of the day, we can't pro just project every quarterback is going to get sacked a, a certain amount of times per year and get hit a certain amount of times per year. You can't predict which one is going to end the guy's season. If Joe Burrow stays healthy, I think he's top 10 in pass attempts. He can give you 15, 20 yards per game on the ground. And his receiver, he might have a, a like literal night and day difference, like a doubly good in terms of per target uh, average at, at his number one receiver spot. What, what so, if Joe Burrow isn't very good? Do you remember the um, he Odell is, though. Beckham? He is. And, do you remember the Zach Mettenberger corollary at LSU with Odell <laughs> Beckham and Jarvis Landry? Because uh, – because Joe uh, Burrow had Justin Jefferson and Jamar Chase and Terrace Marshall and like some other guys. I'm not, I'm no, you know, uh, college football expert, but Justin Jefferson, who set the NFL record for rookie receiving yards, Jamar Chase, who at age 19 won the Blitnikoff award on the same team as Justin Jefferson, Terrace Marshall, who, you know, was probably a first round talent fellow to the second round due to some knee concerns. But, um, you know, what if it was uh, Joe Burrow bringing down A.J. Green and, and not the other way around? Uh, no, nah. <laughs> I, I, I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting uh, exercise, but I, yeah, I look yeah. at it this way. I like Joe to Burrow, think about stuff like this. But Burrow to A.J. Green is five yards a target, and that's a fifth of his of his attempts right there. Uh, you know, so it's like, to me, it was just, you. it's a tough spot for a young quarterback to be in, right? Like, A.J. Green's this legend, franchise legend. He's expecting to be the number one guy. And so you're not, even if he's struggling, you, you're kind of under some pressure every time he gets back to the huddle to keep looking at him. And I, I think that's what held him down. I, like, I think he'll be fine. I think he's a great quarterback. So bad offensive line, might not be that good. Coming off a torn ACL and MCL, I mean, I think, you know, Raybon loves him. I, I would love him. Just finish the show bet. on that note. So I love Raybon. him. Tom Brady versus Joe Burrow. Fantasy points this year. I think uh, Brady has a higher floor, so I'll take Brady. I'll take Brady. The 44-year-old has a higher floor. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, this is this is not great. It's a tough. It's 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 like the more you think about it, it's such a it is a tough decision. But that's why we're here. I, yeah, I agree with Burrow's ceiling. Like in best ball, stack him with one or two receivers. I can totally get behind that. Yeah, and so we're, we're just gonna end it on Burrow. Um, I had Stafford in the outline, but like they're neck and they're Burrow's a thirteenth and ADP. So let's just we'll go uh over Stafford and the rest of the QB two uh, and late rounds here uh, next episode. Um, for this one, um, before you guys go, I just want to get uh, two things. Number one, uh, your top five. Uh, and then number two, your most overrated guy that, that we talked about today. So, um, Evan, start with you. Who, who's your top five again uh, in terms of rankings at quarterback? Yeah, it's, uh, it's always uh, very fluid, but it's Josh Allen, one, Lamar Jackson, two, Patrick Mahomes, three, Kyler Murray, four, um, Dak Prescott five, and then the most overrated guy we talked about today, uh, maybe um, uh, Aaron Rodgers, because I because I'm I'm siding with Schefter and predict, predicting that he won't play, although I could very well be wrong. Uh, and Sean, how about you? Top five and then most overrated. Yeah, so my my top five is Patrick Mahomes at number one, Josh Allen at number two, Kyler Murray at three, Lamar Jackson at four and Dak Prescott at five. And yeah, my overrated pick is Aaron Rodgers at QB eight as well. We, we just don't have enough certainty right now to even know if he's going to be playing week one. So I'm, I'm avoiding him at QB eight. 
Yep, and I'm in the same boat. Mahomes, Allen, Murray, Jackson, Prescott, Aaron Rodgers, too, going too high at QB8, um, given all the uncertainty. Um, Evan, this was a, a pleasure. Um, thank you so much for, for coming on here. You are uh, a GOAT in the industry. Um, tell everybody uh, what, you, what you'll be up to and where they can find you. Yeah, just writing team previews uh, until – training camp starts and probably a little bit into uh, when training camp starts trying to bang those out and mix it in my brother's bachelor party. I'm Amen. the best man. So I gotta, like, I gotta be there for like four days. It's ridiculous. Uh, but it, it, it should be fun. But um, yeah, you can check us out at uh, uh, establish the And I'm at, at Evan Silva on Twitter. And then you, there you have it guys. Uh, you can check Sean out at the underscore odds maker on Twitter and in the action network app. You can find me, at Chris Raybon uh, on Twitter and in the Action app as well. And check out um, actionnetwork.com and the Action app for all of our fantasy, NFL, uh, and betting content and fantasy web as well uh, for our DFS content. Until next episode, thank you for listening to the Fantasy Flex. Let's get this money. Money.